Welcome to I Love to Tell a Story, a podcast in the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schiffedecke. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And this is the podcast for March 26th, 2023, which is the fifth Sunday of Lent. And it's the last in our series of parables that we've had in Matthew, Matthew throughout Lent. And um, it's, a, a, it's a parable normally associated with the second coming, just a reminder that this is actually narratively right before the story of the passion uh, of Jesus. And it begins, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, I like that little detail, then he will sit on the throne of glory and all the nations shall be gathered. And then the separation of the sheep and goat. And I actually have a couple of funny stories about this, but I want to start off with um, what I, th- I think is the coolest um, insight I ever heard about this. And I think it uh, it comes to me via my friend Phil Kwanbeck, but I think he got it from Robert Capon in his uh, uh, book, uh, uh, I think Parables of Grace. Anyway, it was that neither side, neither of the neither of the group knows who they are. So the one says, wait, when did we deny you? And the other says, when was it? <laughs> when did I, um, when was it that we saw the hungry and thirsty or, and they, when did we do? Neither group knows who they are. Yeah. The, uh, when did, when was it we saw you a stranger and welcomed you and naked and gave you clothing? Uh, the, the, um, the sheep <laughs> on the one hand have done this maybe related to what we've been talking about, right, with the learning to live with these upside-down values of the kingdom of heaven, right, that that they are uh, already citizens of that kingdom, already living in such a way so that they, ju- it just, they just do that. Yeah. They just do it, and they don't. Uh, and they don't do it for some kind of eternal reward. They do it because yeah. that's what they know uh, to do. That's that's who they have been formed to be. Yes. And then the goats, of course. Uh, you know, when was it that? Uh, um, yeah. When was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Uh, and he says, truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not, did not do it to me. They have not, um, they have not um, been formed into that, uh, that discipleship. Um, and they've been, one could perhaps even say, been malformed <laughs> into that kind of um, curled in on oneself <laughs> nature of sin that Martin Luther talks about, right? That they ha- they have not had the eyes to see uh, those around them, the least of these. Um, and so they have not responded with grace. They have not responded with generosity. And if we'd known, if we'd known it was right. you, yeah, right. if we'd known it was you, I really am struck uh, by... Um, uh, verses 45 and, and 46, um, uh, particularly the, the end of, of 45, um, where uh, truly, uh, just as you did not do to the least of this, you did not do it to me, which means you didn't recognize the image of Christ in those created in the image of God. And These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And if you will allow me to slip out of Matthew into, I've just uh, finished doing uh, some uh, uh, leading a conference, working through the gospel of John. And uh, in John, this is life to know God and the one whom God has sent. Mm -hmm. And, And so these who have been formed to recognize God and the one God has sent and to see the image of God in humanity have been like a child offering this generosity. And it brings us full circle to Ash Wednesday when the question is, and who is the greatest? And if you're like a child And how is a child? A child is like, you know, I got a little candy. I'm going to give it to you. Unless that child has been, to use your word, malformed. But when a child has been given much, they give generously. And that's that's the power of this. This is life eternal, to know God 
and to recognize the image of God in humanity, then I will care for the least. Yeah, thank you. That's obviously, first of all, brilliant. And it in this story, it's the, the key phrase is the least. Uh, and I, I really think it's brilliant to tie it back to that Ash Wednesday question about who is the greatest and then that whole hum, humility versus welcome. Mm. One thing, uh, two stories or two, or one, one hint, hint and a story. The hint is um, take a look at the history of art on this um, uh, working, uh, dear narrative lectionary preacher. Go out uh, when I taught when I would teach us in college and teach the crucifixion. I would just that day just show art the whole time, uh, and there's a whole series of paintings that will have the sheep on one side and the goats on the other. But of course, they're human beings, right. and um, that's uh, just to watch the way art interprets this. I actually, actually, I lied. I have two stories. The first is a personal story. I had a beautiful Jewish woman who was uh, and scholar who was my Akkadian teacher in uh, a graduate school, which is the Semitic language the Assyrians and Babylonians spoke. And the, there is a word in Akkadian that is for both sheep and goats. Mm -hmm. And I remember Dr. Friedman saying, there's just one word for sheep and goats. They're the same thing. And she goes, I don't know where the separating the sheep and the goats comes from. And I remember <laughs> saying to her, don't worry, Dr. Friedman, that's uh, in the Christian New Testament. That's not, you're not responsible for that material. Uh, but the, so that, but the point is sheep and goats, they, you know, only those who were really in could tell the difference uh, in those era. They're, they're very similar. Whereas for us, we, in our minds, we sharply delineate between the two. The other story is Mother Teresa. About the same time in my, when I was in grad school, Mother Teresa died. And there was a story on NPR, and a very secular person was interviewing uh, somebody in Mother Teresa's circle and said, what was, what was it about Mother Teresa that made her so special? And she said she, and, the, and the person said, she really believed, Matthew 25, uh, that when I do this to the least of you, I do it to Christ. She, she saw in the poor, was it in Calcutta? Calcutta. Jesus. And, and the guy said, no, no, no. I want to know what was special about her. Um, was she a great leader of people? No, no. She saw the least. Well, okay. What was it about her? Was she a great manager? Could she? And finally the person realized this person didn't have ears to hear. Yeah. yeah that yeah. it was actually this simple that she saw the image of Christ in the poor of Calcutta. Right. Hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. And and we continue to um, we continue to see examples like this. I I had the great privilege. Uh, I've just returned uh, from a trip to Tanzania, where um, I led a group of students, and we we um, interacted with and learned from uh, pastors in the Tanzanian Lutheran Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Tanzania. And they uh, are a vibrant uh, church body. They've, they're growing by leaps and bounds. There's 8 million members. And they, they share uh, the gospel, right? I mean, everybody does evangelism, but not in, um, not in the worst sense of that word, right? <laughs> like it's, uh, it's sharing the good news of Jesus in word and deed, uh, both together, and caring for the the lost and the least and the you know the 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 ones who are discarded. So, for instance, just to use one example among many many, uh, they um, they uh, have an orphanage uh, that that was started uh, in the late '90s, uh, or early somewhere in the '90s, to address the problem of street children. Uh, who were orphaned by AIDS, uh, right? The, 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 the scourge of HIV AIDS uh, decimated the population in Tanzania as in much of sub-Saharan Africa. And there were these children who just had no family to take mm -hmm. care of them. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the church, uh, you know, which with a distinct lack of resources, mm -hmm. built an orphanage uh, and, and took care of those children. Um, nowadays, the orphanage is still there. It, it's not, uh, thank God, not so much the scourge of AIDS, but 
uh, instead uh, addressing uh, the scourge of neglect or um, abuse that happens, unfortunately, across societies. Uh, but, you know, the, the, there, there are people that it is easy to overlook, right? Yeah. There are people it, it is easy to not just not see, uh, and, and we have to train our eyes and our ears uh, and our hearts uh, to see in them uh, the, the face of Christ. Uh, and we saw that in Tanzania. We see that, too, in this uh, nation, of course. Uh, but that's, um, yeah, that's what we're called uh, to do, to, to as, as you started out with, Ralph, right? They don't know this. They don't know <laughs> what they're doing. Neither group knows uh, what they've done or not done. But they, uh, they have been formed in such a way that their eyes and their hearts and their... Um, and their ears are open to the least of these, and they and they care for them as um, as fellow bearers of of Christ's image in the world. Sometimes the forming is uh, being exposed to those who we would think are the least. Uh, I too just came back from Africa. I was in Benin among the Methodists, uh, just to just to keep our little uh, denominational divisions alive. No, <laughs> no. Um, uh, I I remember being being told by a, a student once how important it was for her uh, to go to El Salvador as an African American female student from Atlanta, who was who was studying at, at Duke, and. Um, she said she had identified herself as marginalized and oppressed because she was female, she was African-American. And when she went to El Salvador, she said, they saw her first as an American and in that privilege. And this isn't my first time uh, in Africa, but it was my first time in West Africa. And I saw... Um, the economic difference in a way that I'd never paid attention to before and really recognize the riches of what they have in their capacity to share with one another, as you just described, Catherine, that in all that we have in America, we lack because we're constantly hoarding. And the more you give it away, the more you seem to receive. And uh, I think a part of that forming is for us to look and seek to see the image of Christ in every human being and not just in our, those among our tribe. I'm going to close this podcast by prop. Uh, first of all, thank you. I have not been to Africa. I, a wheelchair, it's hard for me to go, which is my lame excuse. Uh, but I want to, leaning into Holy Week when the least of these became Jesus, and no one helped him. I want to recognize that it's easy to give a thirsty person someone a drink if it's not dangerous to do so. But the reason nobody helped Jesus in the end was because they would have gotten crucified too. And sometimes around us, there are those people who need our help that the system of oppression which has a gun in its hand, makes it dangerous to help them. And this is true around the world. And in the end, finally, there's got to be salvation from beyond the power structures of the world. In other words, from God. Amen.